Coming up on Texilla, an iPod dock made out of wood, connecting pro mics to your machine via USB, and how not to set up a wireless access point at the office. And of course, questions, questions, and more questions. So plump up your franks and peel open a bun, because Texilla starts now. This episode of Texilla is made possible by Squarespace, Gamefly, and GoDaddy.com. I'm Patrick Dorton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Texilla. Hands on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or advice on the best place to buy shoes online, I've definitely got an answer for you on that one. How many pairs of shoes have you bought online? We um. can't answer that on the show because her mother will find out. <laughs> so, we pre-taped this episode. If Intel made any massive announcement at IDF, the Intel developer forum earlier this week, or if Apple announced something amazing in their press gathering September 9th, well, we'll be talking about them on next week's show. But we do expect Intel to announce new Core i7 CPUs, along with a lineup of lower-cost i5 processors and the new MOBO chipset, the P55. Which so, apparently is going to be in everything by the end of this everything. year. Everything. So cross your fingers for sick i7 performance on the cheap. Uh, there was another big announcement there on the 9th, wasn't there? Uh, I covet the Leica brand of cameras, mm -hmm. and I have ever since I was eight years old, and, and there was a pro photographer who had one. They're just so cool. I've never been able to make myself pony up the cash they want for a digital camera, and I expect not to be able to afford the digital cameras they announced this week. We should totally, though, so we can get these announcements, tape for release the day before on Friday. So if we tape on Friday, we can have all the week's announcements and then release on Thursday. Yes, well, while you work on your time machine, I'm going to the first question of the day. It's difficult to add a Wi-Fi router or access point at work. My computer is connected to the LAN, however, so I want to turn this into a wireless access point using a spare PCI Wi-Fi adapter I have. I came across a program called the Virtual Access Point, Virtual AP, but I'm not sure if this will work or not. Not. Suggestions, Chad in Florida. Hey, you could use internet connection sharing, which is built into Windows, um, but depending on how hardcore your company is about security, this is a great way to get fired or fired and sued for damages should a hacker snake their way into your company's network via your DOI access point and steal, say, the plans for next year's products or your customer database. Yeah, this is kind of a public service announcement on behalf of sysadmins everywhere. Do not add wireless access to your network just because you can. If you don't secure it properly, and chances are you won't based on the experiences of many networking professionals I've met over the years, you can instantly bypass the security in your office, the security that's maintained for sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars and with the work of dozens of people. Talk to your IT folks first. Offer to buy a new antenna or a router or whatever. Beg, plead, talk to your manager, but do not jury rig coverage. And if you do decide to ignore this and <laughs> violate security protocols and hack your own router in there, pray your company doesn't do regular Wi-Fi audits and at the very least use a random 13 character key on WPA2 security so it won't immediately get hacked by a brute force attack. The security researchers at the Church of Wi-Fi, which is one of my favorite names for a security research group, have compiled something like a million of the top WPA passphrases across the top 1,000 SSIDs and turn them into lookup tables, which are essentially cheat sheets for brute force attacks, which means you could probably have your system cracked open really quickly if you use basic dictionary words. So if you do decide to hack your own router into the office so you can access your iPod Touch from the conference room, you might want to put that card in the machine in somebody else's cube so that when they fire somebody for violating network security protocols, it's not you. Well, those tables are also good to cross-check your own passwords yeah. to make sure that you don't have something particularly vulnerable. Yeah, it's actually kind of amazing. One of the first times I ever heard about uh, the problems with cheap Wi-Fi routers and network security was a guy who worked for a very big international bank who wanted to make sure that there wasn't any too or wasn't there's there's always some bleed out of a Wi-Fi router outside the building. But he worked in Lower Manhattan down mm -hmm. around Wall Street, and he's like he rigged up his antenna to a little handheld uh, uh, device, and he said he walked four blocks and he covered the got the SSIDs and login basically that the SSID is for like over a thousand unlocked or excuse me not a thousand four hundred unlocked 
Wi-Fi routers. Wow. This, this was back in the really early days of Wi-Fi, and he said, you know, we've got these vice presidents, they make a lot of money, they don't want to carry around an Ethernet cable to the conference room, and he said it was rampant that people would just grab like a $100 Linksys router, or probably $200 at the time, jack them into their, their computer, and leave it set to admin and admin, and the security at that time was pretty horrible. Look, don't bypass security in your office just don't. <laughs> it's just, especially, you know what I mean? If, if it's a small office, if it's your office, that's one thing. Um, but, you know, large corporations spend a lot of money to secure Wi Fi basically so that they don't become liable for information leaking out into the public or wild or hackers or mm -hmm. other people. But hey, yeah. on a totally separate note, <laughs> wooden iPod accessories are coming up. But while we've got your attention, video games are cheap and sometimes they suck. If you're dropping 50 bucks for a new title, you can get stuck in our Gamefly, the largest online video game rental service. They've got over 6,000 new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds. Instead of gambling 50 or 60 bucks on a new game, how about 16 bucks a month to become a Gamefly member? You'll get one to four games at a time, you get to keep them for as long as you like, no late fees, no due dates, and the shipping is always free. When you're done playing a game, send it back. Gamefly will send you the next available game on your list. If you really like the game you're playing, simply click Keep It on the Gamefly website and the game is yours at a discounted price. Discounts are good, and Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. You can even trade and use games for credit towards membership fees. What could top all that? How about a two-week free trial? Techzilla fans get a two-week free trial when they sign up at Gamefly.com slash Techzilla. Some restrictions do apply, so you can sign for details, and please support Techzilla by trying out our sponsors like Gamefly. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, folding at home. If you're one of the many thoughtless people who leave their machines running day and night, regardless of whether you're actually doing anything with that machine, well, you got two options. Turn it off and save the earth, or leave it on and run folding at home and help cure diseases. The brainchild of Professor Vijay Pandey at Stanford University, Folding at Home is a distributed computing project. It runs protein folding models across millions of PCs around the world. The idea is to better understand misfolded proteins and hopefully help find treatments for a number of life-threatening illnesses including Alzheimer's, Mad Cal, Huntington's, Parkinson's disease, and a range of cancers. Folding at Home runs on Macs, PCs, 3D video cards from ATI and NVIDIA, and Sony's PS3. You can download and run the Folding at Home client in minutes, and it'll use your machine when you aren't. So if you're going to leave your machines running 24-7, make a contribution to medical science and to humanity a favor by running Folding at Home. Love more hate them. If there's one thing you can say about iPods is that they have tons of accessories. In fact, we recently got a bunch of them in last week, and while they're a bit non-traditional, they're also very interesting. Uh, for example, these wood tech docks from Etsy. Etsy.com. These are handmade from cedar wood. And he's got about, I don't know, 15 of them. He makes them one at a time. You can so see it. Bloop. Yeah, they pretty much fit everything. And it, uh, it connects via USB. I don't think it comes with any kind of uh, wall charger adapter of any kind. Um, <laughs> but if you have the regular standard iPod, you know, the, the AC plug in there, you can right. use that. Um, these are one of my favorite things I've, I've ever seen. And I mean things in a general sense, right. like ever. Look at this. Totally handmade. It smells like wood. It's, well, it's made of wood. Cedar, isn't it? it smells like it just came out of the forest. It's like adding a little bit of that organicness to your life. And it'll probably keep moths out of your closet. <laughs> <laughs> it's cedar. <laughs> like I said, these are handmade, and they're, they run from about $48 to about $120 for the double iPod dock. So basically, if you want the aesthetically appealing and probably not on your coworker's office desk iPod accessory, they're literally one of a kind. So where do they find them on Etsy? On Etsy, you just search for WoodTech, W-O-O-D-T-E-K. I mean, I'm sorry, T-E-C, not like Texilla. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's got a whole list of the ones that are currently available. And he makes them, like I said, one at a time, so you always get something new and different. Now, one of the people we work with, Grace, who works on product acquisition, is a huge fan of unusual speakers, primarily speakers like this, animal speakers. Ones that look like animals. <laughs> <laughs> she loves them. When we were at CES, we actually saw uh, a lot of offerings by the company that makes this particular one, the iPanda, 
We actually looked at the eye pig, pig. The eye pig, which was like twice the size like of this thing. Like a soccer ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is the eye panda version. And the one thing that's really incredible about these is the sound is amazing. It's actually shockingly good because you look at it, it's like a novelty speakers. Novelty mm -hmm. speakers tend to sound like, uh, you know, I don't know, the iPod speaker. It's or an iPhone speaker yeah. at the bottom of a toilet. They tend to be tinny and awful and ugly. And this wasn't, which was kind of shocking. Yeah, and this one is currently on sale for about $120 on the website. And which is not exactly the most inexpensive no. iPod accessory you'll ever find. I mean, that's comparable to like an iHome system. Yes. And uh, this sounds to me better than the iHome dock that I have at home. I think the best Wait, part. <laughs> the <laughs> iHome dock that I have at home. <laughs> No, uh, I'm like an iPod buzzword machine. Um, but this is a great little guy, so you can hear him. It says it's not iPhone compatible, but they all say that, and they all are. You touch the ears to make the sound go up and down. You don't poke the ears. You don't press the ears. You just touch them. You just, you're just patting a little panda. <laughs> Changing the audio. It's really quite wonderful. The thing that's really interesting is that there are... Um, the speakers are up here, or some of the speakers, and they have these little conical designs that actually dissipate the sound and spread right. it further out. Yeah. There's a term for that, and I can't remember it right now. A radial um, dispersion, or you know, I don't know. It's just something you usually <laughs> see in like a like a well, like a higher end kind of speaker system. Well, yeah, usually like the whole like you know we hand carved these speakers. You know what I mean? Like fifty thousand dollar speaker systems with these crazy tweeters sitting on yeah. top of them. So it's kind of amusing to see you know the plastic panda. Pod I would like player. this for my house. You would? I would. Do you find it? I mean, I'll have to fight Grace Tooth and Nail for it to, to for extended testing purposes, of course. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you have over there? So, okay, I, I obviously, as many of you know, I, I find uh, monster cables to be overpriced, expensive, and generally not worth the cash. However, the Monster Mobile Sonatalk, uh, I there's you a found something worth the money, huh? Yeah, actually, it sells for ten bucks and uh, works right. with iPhones, Blackberries, pretty much any kind of cell phone, and. You know, I had a cell phone. No, just a do you want? Ago. Would you like this one? Oh, hey, <laughs> <laughs> this one I've been docking over here. There you go. <laughs> you know, I handed it to you, and I still forgot. It's a pretty basic product. Um, you, ba you, in my case, because I'm I'm rocking the cassette adapter in my car because I haven't uh, installed my new stereo yet. But basically, the idea is that you can use a high-end set of headphones, and it adds a microphone on your line input. Oh, cool. And it works extremely well. If you like nice headphones and you still want to be able to make phone calls with them, the the iPhone actually handles that pretty gracefully and so you clip this onto your headphones and you have your headphones that you like instead of those horrible little earbuds that shipped with the iPhone. But you can still do the talking part when a call comes in. Yeah, the one thing I don't like about this is the fact that it's, you know, by the time you get your headphones or whatever plugged into it, it sticks out two to three inches. So it is prime for tearing up your iPhone by being dropped or, you know, if you knock up against a wall or something with it. But other than that, though, it works shockingly well. And everybody's been talking to me on the phone lately since I started using the... Since your AT&T service has actually started yes. working again. Has been shocked because they also want to know because I, I traditionally have used a Bluetooth wireless adapter in the car, which has been miserable to awful. Really? Because we had that whole roundup of Bluetooth the car best, adapters. I still think the best of the Bluetooth wireless ones still fade by comparison to a hardwired connection. Well, of course. So we that, tell people that all the time. Yeah, but you know what I mean? So, but a lot of people who have been normally frustrated with me talking in the car outside of the safety issues have been a little less... Uh, uh, disturbed. So we get a, a, actually a lot of questions about the iGo system. There are radio shacks everywhere, a lot of other consumer electronics stores. Um, are they worth the money is the basic question. This is part of the iGo Everywhere Power Kit, and the idea is that you buy one adapter and you buy different tips for different devices. This is one is the iPhone iPod adapter. Mm -hmm. um, I got stuck in San Diego, sans iPhone and mini USB and camera charger, so I went to the Radio Shack and I picked up the iGo. Uh, everywhere kit and it gives you the car adapter and then there's also an adapter that plugs in a 120 volt wall socket and I also picked up a splitter so I could charge multiple devices at once. Is it cheap? No. Is it adaptable just about anything you might be carrying or might carry in the future? Yeah, as long as it doesn't draw a huge amount of amperage. So it's pretty future proof for all gadgets and cell phones that don't come, like you used to get like, you know, mobile adapters in the box with a lot of stuff. Now they want you to buy the extra. So it actually would be kind of fun to test this with three or four devices on there. Uh, it would be nice to also see how much heat's generated at that point. I think they gave out a little kit at CES last year. I don't I know go? if it was iGo, but it was something very similar, and it has been a freaking lifesaver. I don't know if I'd pay $40 for it like that kit, but it's nice to have all the different adapters and be able to charge things over yeah. USB, you know, when you're at an airport and you've got one of those travel base stations there. That's yeah.
yeah, this one, now. I haven't found the USB adapter for this one for the notebook, which might be might be a negative for folks, but I do have a wall wart adapter that comes with this one. So that's, now, that's what is this really little analog wart. thing you've got over here? So this is actually from one of our viewers, uh, Brad, sent in his pride and joy, the Tico Fold travel stand for the iPhone, iPod, and iPod Touch. You can buy it through the Amazon store. Uh, he actually, it's kind of interesting, he decided he couldn't find any portable docks for his iPhone. Oh. So he designed and developed and had manufactured the Tico travel stand. And the idea is that when you are sitting on the plane or at your hotel desk, you can prop your iPhone up and see what's going on. Uh, TicoProducts.com or store.TicoProducts.com for green, black, orange, or white versions for 10 bucks. I have needed exactly this thing on so many occasions. You would not believe the things I've jury rigged. <laughs> on airplanes to hold up my iPhone so I can watch movies. You know, from like, from cushions to like sweaters folded in strange origami shapes to support <laughs> the weight, to like cups put on certain things and bent over with popsicle sticks, I made that part up. But you get the idea. This is the, exactly the kind of thing that I would use all of the time. And I love that he was just like, what's something I need? What's something that doesn't exist that I could use in my day-to-day -day life? And he came up with that and he freaking made it himself and he's selling it now. So, so good on ya. That's incredible. Folds flat for storage. My only concern, I gotta say, Brad, hopefully the joint will not disintegrate over time. Uh, it's a very maybe. thin plastic joint. Yeah, so you tape it up. That's what duct tape is for. It's still got that thing on the back. That's all you really need. <laughs> that's the real, that's the kicker right there, that little kickstand. Brad, I love you've, it. you've made Ms. Belmont happy. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but coming up next, a device that also makes me happy that lets you run ProSpec microphones into a USB port. But first. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace. Here to tell you more is our PA, Annie. Hi everyone, it's me, Annie. If you want to create a kick-ass website or spice up the one you already have, look no further than Squarespace.com. With Squarespace, you're not limited by cookie-cutter designs or clumsy code. You have complete control over the look and feel of your site. Now, last week I got the idea to make a website that aggregates just the uplifting, empowering, happy news stories from every cycle, and called it Just the Good News. With Squarespace, I was able to set up a simple interface where I repost all the good news that I come across, along with category indexes so viewers can browse the stories based on type. Medical miracles, tearful reunions, heroic feats, stuff like that. From there, I wanted to create a few different ways for people to subscribe and participate. So I set up a contact form for feedback, an RSS option, and links to Twitter so that visitors can receive a little sunshine in their media feed if they so choose. What's great about using Squarespace is that you don't have to deal with a single inch of programming code or any third-party plugins ever. Everything you need is right there and can be accessed or changed with the click of a mouse. No code, no headaches, no experience necessary. Once I've set up the site, I can track what content is most popular, where my views are coming from, and who's subscribing. Better yet, you can sign up for a free trial today at squarespace.com. And for all you Techzilla viewers, using the code TechZ, that's T-E-K-Z, gets you 10% off the whole lifetime of your order if you sign up for the paid version of Squarespace. All that, plus the satisfaction of keeping Techzilla on the air. So if you're looking to start a website, you definitely want to check out squarespace.com first. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, I Fix It. If you've ever wanted to take matters into your own hands when it comes to fixing your gadgets, it's probably time for you to check out ifixit.com. This site has it all when it comes to repairing, troubleshooting, and ripping apart your favorite gadgets. They're Apple-centric, so if you've got a broken MacBook or iPhone, this is the place to buy the parts you need and find the manual to fix it yourself. It's really all about empowering you to learn and understand the way your gadgets work from the inside out. The repair guides are all free and they have fantastic step-by-step -step instructions with photos to show you exactly what to do. They also list the tools you'll need to get the job done and if you don't have them already, you can pick them up easily from their parts store. But probably my favorite section is the teardowns. This is the area where users submit their dissections of their gadgets, from the brand new PS3 Slim to a Starbucks barista. The machine, not the person. They do have some guidelines for the teardowns, so it's not a total free-for-all. But the key idea here from the Maker's Manifesto is, if you can't open it, you don't own it. So take some proactive ownership of your gadgets by visiting iFixit today. 
Sure has recently released some nifty products, and this one is no exception. The Sure X2U is an XLR to USB adapter, and it's pretty much solved all my podcasting on the go needs, not to mention any kind of audio recording on the go. With a mic, this X2U and a laptop, you'll never need to lug around anything else. Uh, but it's great for home and musician use as well. And uh, you, you can see right here, it's got all the things you would need. It's got mic gain, volume, and monitor. And the monitor is probably my favorite aspect of this right here. You can plug in any headphones in, and you get no late latency see real-time monitoring of all the sound that's coming in from the XLR. That's nice. So basically it's a microphone preamp, mm -hmm. monitor, does it do phantom power also? It does. It has a 48 volt phantom power here so you can use condenser mics if is you need to. Is it powered to. all off the USB jack? It is. I believe it is powered all off the USB jack. I mean there's no other place to you plug in any, any kind of, there's no AC <laughs> adapter or battery batteries that go in this thing at all so yeah it's all off the laptop. That's actually pretty amazing. Yeah. Because um, one of the things you, we get asked a lot is like, how can I improve my recording? What can I do? I, okay, so I, I, I'm going to brace myself now. Not that sure is particularly expensive, like the SM58's, the punk rock microphone of choice, but what's the cost on that? It's one fifty-eight, one hundred fifty-eight dollars. It's not bad for a piece of pro-ish gear, you know. But there are <laughs> other items on the market that I'll talk about later that do the same thing for a lot less. Really? I just don't know how the quality difference is. Well, I mean, sure is kind of like the the it, okay and. Before the tapers in the audience <laughs> email in the uh, or the, the 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 audio recording enthusiasts, I mean you can spend thousands of dollars on a collection of mics, but mm -hmm. for a good bone stock recording mic, an SM57, an SM58, and it's just, that's actually pretty slick. So it basically it's just an inline cable adapter. Yep, that's all there is to it. You can see that it's doing its thing now. It's connected, so it lights up here. So anytime it's getting noise, it. Oh, that's really awesome. Yeah, it's monitoring So no more that. test one, two, three, test one, two, three, and oh, that's so cool. Sorry, I'm like thinking <laughs> out with an LED light, which is a sad state of affairs. So I was playing with it um, a little bit this past week. I'm using Sound Studio here to record, and uh, you can just check your preferences, and it shows up as a plug and play piece here. Sure input. So a standard USB adapter. Yeah, and I use it as the input and output. You don't even need to plug in your headphones into the into the laptop to listen back because then you probably will get some, a little bit of latency. <laughs> so this is much better for doing that kind of thing. Let's see, we'll test it out here. I haven't tried it with this microphone yet, so we'll see how it works. Check, check, check. There, you can see. And one of the problems I've always had with, with uh, <laughs> you know, kind of hacking a little podcasting setup is that right. I never can get the levels that I'm looking for. For whatever reason, whenever I use a headset, the levels always come out a little bit lower. And but you this, are an audio engineer by training, I should point out. I am, indeed. <laughs> and it's really embarrassing when I record Sword and Laser with my crappy, crappy headset. <laughs> and it sounds terrible. And I'm popping and fizzing all over the place. And I sound way crappier than Tom does with his. Because he uses like a 57 right. and, and a, like a four channel board, a four it track probably board. probably has a little you know, pop deflector in front of it. Yeah, so if you put a little, like a little spit guard here, a little pop screen, it would be great. I mean, that's the only issue that I have is like pop a lot, poppy, poppy, poppy. <laughs> but yeah, the frequency range is 20 to uh, 20K hertz. Which is probably better than the microphones most people own. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. You can use pretty much any microphone right. with this, and it's not, you're not going to get too much affectation on the frequency range. I'll just say, I mean, the, the fact that it has phantom power built in is really nice. That is which sick. Means you can use yeah. a pretty high-end microphone. Yeah, I'm really happy with this. I mean, like, I didn't really expect it to be that big of a deal right. when I got it. I was like, oh, well, you I told know, you people eh, get like, okay. it showed up and it was sitting in, in your on your desk in our office, and people would walk by and pick it up and be like, can I be like, no? <laughs> I can't and believe literally this goes a half practice. dozen. I mean, we've got a bunch of people that are really into music in our office. A couple of DJs, some people who are involved in audio production in various aspects of their lives. But this was something everybody was really curious about. Yeah, the only other device out there that's like this that I've been able to find is the Blue Microphones uh, Icicle. Oh, interesting. Which is basically the same thing. I mean, it's a USB to uh, sorry XLR to USB adapter, but the difference is it's a hundred dollars less. It's only about sixty bucks. That's a big difference. And I can't tell why. I mean, the specs aren't too much different. Does it have all the controls? I mean, it could be the quality of the DACs, it could be the monitoring. That's the thing. I want to get one in and test them side by side to see if there's any kind of discernible difference in the audio quality or what functionality or features they have different. And then we could start like a Texilla product face-off where there were two products with similar specs duking it out. Duking it out for gadget supremacy. Wouldn't that be original? Oh, gee, I wonder, <laughs> is there another show like that somewhere on the internet? Weird. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is a pick for me. I definitely want to hold on to something like this. I'd buy it myself and use it for podcasting on the go all the time. Well. Yeah. I endorse this heartily. <laughs>
and she's not even being paid. No. Coming up next, more viewer questions. But first, GoDaddy.com. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com is what you need. .com the answer is a little less than dollar and ninety nine cents a month. Plus, world class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and so much more. Your website visitors, prospects, and customers are wary of websites and online businesses that aren't what they claim to be and worried that their personal and financial information might fall into the wrong hands. Turn your visitors' concerns into a competitive advantage with the ironclad protection of a GoDaddy.com secure certificate. Enter code TECH4, that's T-E-K-4 when you check out. You'll save an additional 15% off any order of $75 or more. Some restrictions apply. See the site for details. And be sure to check out revision3.com slash GoDaddy for all the TechZilla GoDaddy deals and codes. Please get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com and use a TEK code when you do. You'll be helping out TechZilla and saving yourself some cash. Our next question comes from Joel out in Minnesota. He writes, I've been looking a lot at Blu-ray player reviews lately and been thinking about picking one up, especially with the PS3 price drop coming soon. But all my high-def TVs are only 720p, and none of the reviews I've seen mention performance on a lower-end TV. Is it worth it to buy a high-end player if I'm not going to get the full 1080 experience? Well, I don't know if I'd call a PS3 a high-end player, but it is. is I, I haven't seen the slim version of the PS3 yet, but the PS3... I would beg to differ. What's that? I would beg to differ, but that I'm not I haven't so seen I the say. PS3 Slim yet, no. or that the PS3 is a high-end player. That it's a high-end player. Well, compared to like the thousand-dollar players that came out when Blu-ray originally came out, that are almost all apparently now functionally useless because they're not receiving updates anymore, or some of the you know what I mean like some of the dedicated Blu-ray players are pretty hardcore by comparison. But the, the prices of all of them are cheap. As a matter of fact, you can probably buy a dedicated Blu-ray player of high quality for less than the cost of the new PS3. Uh, especially from Samsung and even Sony's prices have come down. Hmm. The point, though, is is it worth it to have Blu-ray discs for a 720p television? I would say yes. I would say yes, too. Because either one of them are going to be better. Basically, the, the Blu-ray disc, even if you're not going to have the full 1080p quality that might be on the disc, you're still going to have a ton more visual information encoded on that disc compared to a DVD. Look, I love DVD. I have an amazing collection of DVDs. I've been watching DVDs pretty much since as soon as I could afford a DVD player when they came out. But it's essentially, you know a low resolution window and a 720p has a huge amount of pixels on the screen compared to what the DVD stores in its frame image so yeah actually go for it um, and start thinking about using you know HD in any format even if it's only available in 720p is going to look a lot better than stuff that's basically designed for NTSC use indeed sorry <laughs> no that's true I, I mean I, I totally agree with you I get passionate about it it's the whole HD understandably thing. sorry I'll... yeah he made a whole show about it that's how passionate he is about it <laughs> right, I love me the HD do it man do it <laughs> and the longer you wait the cheaper it'll get so feel free that's to true. wait for a while too all right our next email is from Lyman Lyman writes I have an old printer that uses a parallel port to connect to the computer what's the cheapest way to get it to connect to a machine without a parallel port parallel to USB converter cable some sort of Wi-Fi adapter yeah, well, first you probably want to make sure there's drivers that work with your operating system. There's nothing sad, because you know, like, a bunch of people in the audience are like, you should throw away that parallel port printer. Well, if it's like an Oki data printer that's used for an ordering system or a warehouse, you may not want to throw that away. But yes, Veronica speaks truth. First, make sure there are actually drivers for that printer that'll work with your OS. Yeah. Uh, then basically pick up a parallel port to USB adapter and give it a shot. It's amazing those USB adapters. They do all sorts of things. The USB, yeah. <laughs> I always thought like, who would use a USB to serial cable adapter until my freaking $300, I realized that I no longer can buy a notebook with the port that will work with my $300 ODB2 or OBD2 code reader for my oh, car. interesting. And then like the, the, the modern version of the OBD2 cable for my car that adds USB is like 300 bucks again. So it's like, I'm going to use me a serial adapter because yeah, it's would, easier than keeping an old IBM notebook around. I would figure like 20 bucks from a retailer. You'll probably have to buy one online though because I think even in stores around here, they're probably not too common yeah, these days. Well, you can buy an EEPROM programmer and, and like a freaking bag of space rocks or like space ice cream and a few mm. hundred pounds of solder on Sunday afternoon at a fries in the Bay Area, but I don't think even fries has a parallel port adapter in stock for USB. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, our last question comes from Jason up in Ontario, Canada. Jason writes, just wondering, what is in the future for larger capacity drives in notebooks? Right now, the largest drive that I can find is 500 gigabytes and has been for a couple of years. Is all new research going into SSD? And when do you think they will be up around one terabyte? 
Huh. You know, I don't think all new research is going into SSD. No, because just it's trending. It's yes. for sure, but S I mean, look, SSDs. The performance boost from an SSD, a, a solid state drive. It's basically memory on a drive. And I'm, my my beloved friend John C. Dvorak and his hatred of solid state drives aside, look, the performance boost from an SSD. Oh, drive I'm so is surprised ridiculous. he hates something completely. Well, that's, yeah. What? Who hates SSD drives? He basically drives? wrote about, well, actually, some people who do data recovery aren't real thrilled uh, with them. All right. And, well, that's a different animal, and they're, they're I guess. people who have had a massive SSD failure who have been adopting them lately or a little I've down. I've also them. had some experience with that, but that doesn't mean I hate them. Well, that's no, such a but, strong word. It's a freaking solid state drive. Well, you've never <sighs> hated an inanimate object? No, anyway. How about on. Zipcar? I hate zip code. <laughs> Any case, look, the, the performance boost from a solid state drive is ridiculous. There's power savings for notebooks too. However, 750 gigabyte 2.5 inch hard drive started shipping earlier this year. Want. Once, yes, but finding one of those or one of the new one terabyte two and a half inch drives from Western Digital or Hitachi is just about impossible what? right now. Probably because the one terabyte Western Digital, for example, is 12.5 millimeters, not 9.5 millimeters, so the drives won't fit in pretty much every notebook out there, much less my Dell Mini, because I have a, I have a desire to have like a terabyte, like all of my music on my little Dell Mini. Uh, the heat <laughs> damage to the keyboard that might result is to the side, and who knows yeah. what it would do to the battery life. Yeah, you can't, you can't buy like, oh, OEMs are buying them for weird installations. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to be on like a new egg or a Tiger Direct or something like that no. right about now. That said, um, later this year, bigger 9.5 drives are probably going to show up, uh, but probably not as fast as all of us would like. I want a one terabyte hard drive in my it's, computer. It's actually crazy. 500 gigabyte, two and a half inch drives, and 9.5 millimeter drives that'll fit in notebooks, sell them for under 100 bucks now. Like <sighs> 85, 90 bucks if you, if you get lucky on sale. Technology, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, but that next jump, I think they're waiting for a, in, basically in a major aerial data density. Either that or they don't want to do, because those one terabyte drives are three, 333 megabyte platters. Mm -hmm. So if they did two 333 megabyte platters that would fit inside a 9.5 millimeter enclosure, you'd have a 666 megabyte drive. Do the math. <laughs> have you checked out Hack 5 lately? They've been getting into wireless sniffing tools, Amazon Kindle hacks, multi OS booting USB keys, and building a corporate network from the ground up. It's good stuff. If you're into hacking and the corporate IT lifestyle, or so convincing it, you can't miss Hack 5 every Wednesday at revision3.com slash HAK5. I went to a Kindle hacking session at a conference uh, two weeks ago. Really? Yes. Did Are you, you know it's running, it's running ARM Linux? Really? That's what it's running, and they tried like tethering stuff and all sorts of, you know, listening to it talk to the mothership <laughs> through different ports, and it was super interesting. So I hope they talk about that. It goes from your notebook to the Kindle to the Wi Fi, or not the Wi Fi, the EVDO modem on the Kindle. Amazon hasn't come after the guy yet that was uh, teaching the class, so we'll see. And for all of you watching, we live on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how to's, you ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails. So don't be shy, send them on in to techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of your friends and family when they see your shiny mug on our shiny show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Yes, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. We'll see you next week on TechZilla. Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to <laughs> So lifelike. <laughs> Cthulhu. Show everybody one more time, Veronica. I want to make sure they get the shot for the bloopers. I was just showing you how the Cthulhu swims through the ocean, hunting for prey. I'm keeping this classy. It's over there. Over there. It's over there. She knows she wants it in the bloopers. She wants to be famous on YouTube. And Veronica ruins another episode of Texella. Hardly. This is going to be the most downloaded episode ever. <laughs>
No, I have not to try to add three or four splitters onto here. Because I'd like to see if I can charge like four devices It'd be fun to test just for yeah. giggles. <laughs> I can't say <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>